My name is Lyle Murphy, and today we're going to be talking about orthomolecular medicine and orthomolecular psychiatry, uh, a subject very near and dear to my heart, because when we were forming the organization of Alternative to Med Center 15 years ago um, to help people with coming off psychiatric meds, honestly, there was really not a lot of information out there except for um, what these orthomolecular people had done and a few other uh, noble renegades. So I got teamed up with a fellow by the name of Michael Lesser, who um, worked. Uh, he was one of the original pioneers of orthomolecular medicine, and that was my uh, start into this thing. So what does orthomolecular mean? That's the first question. What does orthomolecular mean? Ortho means correct or straight in Latin, and molecules mean chemistry. So if you put that together, it means correct chemistry. What is the correct chemistry for our biological being? What are the naturally occurring substances that create an optimum environment for our brain to be able to function? Probably not going to be sugar. It's probably not going to be even caffeine. It's probably not going to be white flour or white rice or other things that really don't have the capacity to form neurochemistry and brain function. So are the molecular by and large, means the study of those things that create the optimal environment for mental health to naturally occur. Uh, who is Linus Pauling is our second question. Well, Dr. Linus Pauling uh, is the person who coined the term um, orthomolecular medicine. And he holds the unique distinction of a person who won the Nobel Prize twice, uh, independently awarded. So he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, discovering the double bonds between um, carbon atoms, and also for dis uh, the second Nobel Prize was uh, Peace Prize for uh, Nobel Peace Prize. But he published in, oh, now I can't remember if it's Lancet or Nature magazine. Apologize if I'm wrong, but um, I believe it was the Lancet. He published the term orthomolecular, and um, it really was the first, um, one of the first, like, the there wasn't a whole lot of conventional uh, allopathic psychiatry at the time, so it was sort of like homeopathy back in the 1800s compared to all allopathy. There wasn't a lot of substance behind drug psychiatry at that point. There was a bit. This was sort of, sort of the counter-narrative, and um, Dr. Linus Pauling is one that shot that into the um, annals of time for us. Uh, question number three, who is Abram Hoffer? Well, Abram Hoffer was a Canadian doctor and um, a psychiatrist who was using what would be the, what would then lead to be orthomolecular medicine as back as early as uh, 1951. And him and a fellow named Humphrey Osmond were working with uh, groups of schizophrenics to try to come up with other ways um, besides some of the things that were happening at the time, including um, lobotomies and dropping people in cold water and other what would be considered torture nowadays um, to help people with uh, schizophrenia. They created the first ever double-blind study in psychiatry. Um, it was a nine-year-long study and had a population base sufficient enough to generate real outcome measures. Um, it was placebo-controlled. And um, what they found is that they had a 74% efficacy at treating schizophrenic patients with vitamin C and niacin uh, and thereby keeping them from being re-hospitalized for up to five years. So in order to be considered one of that 74%, you had to do what would be massive doses. I mean, they were doing niacin doses as high as like 12 or more grams, which is a good bit, and buffering it with vitamin C. And they claimed a 74% success rate keeping people out of the hospital for a duration of five years. So um, that's considerably good when you're talking about the, that particular population. Um, question number four, is orthomolecular a suitable alternative for psychiatric meds? Now, this is the road we went down in the beginning. We had believed that um, we could replace drugs with um, supplements, and that's what people needed. They needed a good diet. They needed um, supplementation, super supplementation even, and um, that was the majority of what would be the replacement for um, pharmacology. Um, yeah, it worked up to a point. We definitely had some very strong 
uh, metrics around 25% efficacy for the schizophrenic population. Um, I measured it slightly different. Um, I had to get, to, for, it wasn't just about hospitalization for me, it was about um, giving people a quality of life. So when we did the metrics, it's more around quality of life stuff. Um, it definitely helped. It definitely helped a lot. But along the way, we found that a lot of people were toxic, you know, or that people had certain genetics but had to be respected in certain ways um, in order to be able to, you could still do it through nutraceuticals, let's say, but um, sometimes it had to be unpoisoned. So we, we not, that, not that detoxes would not be considered a part of the Earth's molecular program, it would, but sort of the origins of the super supplementation, we found that the supplementation worked up to the point that a person was toxic. Like, for instance, if this room, well, obviously there's oxygen in this room, or I would be breathing. If there were also carbon monoxide in this room, my hemoglobin would prefer the carbon monoxide, which would then bind to my hemoglobin, and the oxygen wouldn't be able to penetrate it. There's still oxygen in the room, but my red blood cells are not going to be able to grab onto that because those spaces have now been poisoned or occupied by carbon monoxide. And if I don't get the carbon monoxide out of this room, uh, I'm going to die. So it would be like, instead of getting rid of the carbon monoxide, just adding more oxygen. So a lot of the super, super supplementation efforts we did, um, I think they fell short in the beginning because we were not unpoisoning people. So after that, we added a layer of environmental medicine to our, um, to our program and to what we did with people, which was really strategically trying to pull out heavy metals and other organic poisons that were poisoning these pathways. Once we did that, uh, we now enjoy a 75% long-term success rate getting people off of antipsychotic medications. That's our lowest uh, outcome measure. And we don't always advocate that everyone gets off of their antipsychotic medications for safety reasons during the, the, for the duration of the program. So uh, the 75% for us means that not only did people not go back to the hospital, but for six months at least, it had to be at least six months out of the program, during that six months or greater period, up to four years, their symptomatology did not increase over the point where it was on medications on 20 different parameters. So that was how we measured our outcomes. Um, I truly believe in the orthomolecular um, um, uh, philosophy. It's one that has served us the most. And realistically, I mean, these guys just saw things really simple, you know, like, 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 like um, Dr. Lance Pauling saw things very simple. Like, if you're eating this garbage, if you're eating stuff that has been packaged and been sold to you that has a shelf life that's going to last on the shelf, it really is not imparting to you the nutritive quality that it takes to make this thing work. You know, this thing is a biochemical organ. What does that mean? Like, it's that our heart is like, cells and, and cardiovascular, the rest of our body, even our kidneys, comparatively, those cells are, are like the equivalent of tanks compared to what our brain chemistry is. Very small shifts in our chemistry can produce a lot of chemical change. Our brain is meant to respond to chemical change. So when we're getting poisons from our environment, when we're getting um, Xenobiotics, which basically mean things that aren't supposed to be in our body, poisons. They can be hormone mimickers. They can be things that interfere with our endocrine function, aminotoxins. Uh, yeah, I mean, things that just mimic even neurotransmitters, uh, pesticides, things like that. We're poisoning the chemistry itself. And it doesn't always take, I mean, a little bit of mercury can poison a lot of your neurochemical function. A little bit of LSD can obviously alter the mechanics of you know, mic microdoses, micro, micro amounts of, of, of different chemicals can affect us profoundly. And we're living in a chemical world. So what these guys are really saying is like, limit the amount of chemicals that you're taking in and go for whole natural organic foods for your mental health. And, that, and it seems like, well, that's, that's very, um, you know, that's very, it's more commonplace nowadays that we're starting to understand that. But back in the 50s and 60s, this was not something that was being talked about. These guys were true pioneers. These are the true pioneers, I believe, that have brought um, the nutritional mental health, nutritional psychiatry uh, to the forefront 
of how to treat people's mental health. And it's what gave us the roots to really tap in to make our program successful. So I want to be, give a big shout out to um, these orthomolecular doctors whose shoulders uh, that we stand tallly upon to help people uh, to get through their mental health crises here at the center. Thank you very much.